until then, uh, so, okay, we're, we're being filmed, right, I'll leave you, uh, I'll leave you with uh, the talker, uh, Jerome Lewis. Okay, well, good evening everyone, and uh, thank you for turning out on a rough and windy night. Uh, I'd like to thank Robert Shillock and, uh, Shilcock sorry, and Amy Gainsford for organising this, and it's a really a great pleasure to be here uh, to talk to you all. It's very rare, I think, that social anthropologists venture out of their normal uh, uh, areas, and, uh, and this is certainly a stretch for me, but uh, I'm very happy to be here indeed. Um, I guess I should first start with a little uh, uh, sort of clarification. When I talk about music, uh, I'm not trying to isolate it as some very unique and e e easily definable, cross-culturally at least, uh, phenomenon. It's part of a sort of human communicative spectrum, and music is at one point on that, and language is at another point. And I consider these to be things that mix and interchange depending on the particular communicative uh, moments uh, and styles that different people around the world have used. So uh, bear that in mind, but uh, I do think there's something very distinctive that we recognize as music when we hear it, uh, and that's what I'm referring to here. So uh, what this talk really is about is that uh, we know that language evolved when humanity lived in Africa um, as hunter-gatherers. But what might African hunter-gatherers have to tell us as researchers trying to understand the evolution of language and music about uh, the relationship between music and language and about their evolution? So while these music and language evolved among African hunter-gatherers, such, such groups' use of language and music have been strangely absent in theorizing about the origins of music and language and their points of view are rarely taken into account by researchers working on this. So this paper, and the, the, or the paper of this lecture comes from, seeks to remedy this omission and proposes that taking their views and practices into account suggests that singing, which respects costly signaling uh, evolutionary theory, must have evolved first. Once practiced by a social group, singing has clear survival advantages when used to ward off dangerous animals that women and children still use and refer to today. This insight is taken to suggest that chorusing groups of early hominins established a unique social context in, work, in which certain key prerequisites for language could evolve, most notably vocal dexterity, vocal learning, imitation, we intentionality, the sense of ourselves as a group rather than just individuals, group-wide trust, and eventually a normative space of shared values. It's in such a context that increasing iconicity could evolve without resistance from conspecifics into symbolism and no long that no longer respects costly sing signaling constraints. Contemporary African hunter-gatherers offer more insight into the conditions facing evolving humans than any other group for the following four reasons. Firstly, the environmental context. Homo sapiens originated in Africa and have lived in Africa for about three times longer than anywhere else in the world. The African environment is therefore more relevant for understanding key factors affecting human evolution. Contemporary hunter-gatherers are still closely dependent on this environment. Of particular significance in the context of my argument here <coughs> is the role played by large predators and other dangerous animals in human evolution. Consider feline predators with superb night vision such as lions. Using night vision technology, Derek and Beverly Joubert realized that over 80% of Botswana lion kills occurred during the darkest hours of night. Lions are extremely conscious of the moon, simply giving up hunting once the moon begins to rise, realizing that without cover, they're quickly spotted by their prey. Similarly, examining reports of lion attacks on over 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 Tanzanians between 1988 and 2009 in which two-thirds of the victims were killed and eaten, Craig Packer and colleagues note that the success vary, rates varied strikingly with moon phase because lions prefer to attack at night in the complete darkness. Our African hominin ancestors <coughs> co-evolved with nocturnal feline predators during six million years. The ecological niche of early Pleistocene hominins included a formidable community of at least 12 species of saber-toothed cats, eight species of other felines, and nine hyena species. 
Packer and colleagues remind us that we have always been exposed to the risks of predation that have cycled with the waxing and waning of the moon. Being relatively small and vulnerable, with poor night vision, early hominins must have faced severe risks of predation when moving around on open ground. For millions of years, whether along shorelines or deep inland, the nocturnal threat posed by big cats at dark moon must surely have influenced the human need for group living and the mastery of fire and our innate fear of darkness. The very fact that hominins began living in increasingly large groups can be attributed to predation pressure. The second feature I'd like to uh, point out is the social context. James Woodburn elucidated the core structural fe features of assertively egalitarian immediate hunter-gatherers, uh, immediate return, sorry, hunter-gatherer political and economic organization. And he showed that these are globally consistent. <coughs> Members of such groups consume most of their food on the day that they produce it, reject private property, move to avoid conflict rather than fight, and do not depend on specific others for access to land, key resources, weapons or tools. A range of mechanisms, centrally demand sharing, but also gambling, ritual or gifting, ensure that valued gifts, uh, goods sorry, circulate without making people dependent on one another. People who brag, try to claim status or assert authority on others are mercilessly teased, mocked and avoided. Although such societies are rare today, they include some pygmy groups in Central Africa, Hadza in Tanzania, some San groups in Namibia and Botswana, several groups in India, such as the Jarawa or the Sentinelese of the Andaman Islands, recently in the news, and in Southeast Asia, the Agta, Batek, Manik, Penan and others. The global distribution of these cultural traits suggests that such social systems are highly stable and successful adaptations whose key elements predate human migrations out of Africa. Theorizing about early modern humans should take these core traits into account. The third aspect is the genetic context. Shared ancient genetic markers connect the four major groups of immediate return African hunter-gatherers, Khoisan in southern Africa, western and eastern pygmies in the forests of central Africa, and in East Africa, the small population of Hadza. Recent research into their genetics allows us to track the time depth of their separation into distinct lineages. It's probable that they all descended from an original proto khoisan pygmy population living somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, well before the major dispersal of modern, of modern humans outside the continent. Based on the ethnography <coughs> from the contemporary descendants of these African lineages, Camilla Power has elucidated the likely Middle Stone Age agricultural features relating to cosmology and patterns of gendered ritual common to Khoisan pygmies and Hadza. The logic of seeking safety in numbers at night predicts that our ancestors would form the largest assemblies precisely during the monthly period of greatest danger, around Dark Moon. Power finds that lunar cosmology appears to be an ancient common feature shared by African hunter-gatherers with important ritual gatherings still occurring at no moon. And symbolic interaction between the spheres of production, hunting, and reproduction, menstruation and pregnancy, infused with lunar symbolism. These symbolic oppositions have resulted in distinctive gender division of labor and a system of prohibitions based on keeping the blood of hunting uh, separate from the hu that of human fertility, and a suite of rituals in which gendered norms reverse, with reverse dominance being periodically ritually reenacted by women in relation to men. Given these continuities and our African origins, I'll focus particularly on the Bayaka pygmies with whom I've been conducting ethnographic research since 1994. They are a highly resilient, egalitarian group whose contemporary adaptation to hunting and gathering in Central Africa is suggestive of principles relevant for understanding the evolutionary relationship between music and language. The greatest number of contemporary hunter-gatherers in the world live in the forests of the Congo Basin. Estimates of their overall numbers vary between 300 and 900,000 people. The Bayaka groups I'll be focusing on here occupy forest west of the Ubangi River uh, in this area here. 
Uh, and although they have different names, they're all part of the Bayaka group and their, their names are actually contractions of Bayaka. They some call themselves Baka, others Biaka, Baka and Bayaka. But they're all essentially recognizing themselves as the same group. Uh, in DRC, you have these groups in the center here who are, are very mixed groups, a set of very mixed groups we don't know so much about. And then these are the famous Mbuti pygmies that Colin Turnbull studied in the 1950s and 1960s uh, and are well known in the ethnographic literature. Many of these groups still largely depend on hunting and gathering in an immediate return society, though others, such as the Bongo, the Kola, or the Gyeli, uh, and many Baka, are engaged in increasingly diversified livelihoods. The term Bayaka is contracted in different ways by each of these different groups. I'll use the word Bayaka unless I'm referring to a specific uh, uh, group and use their individual ethnonym uh, in that case. So despite the great diversity of situations that many pygmy groups find themselves in today, they share remarkable similarities. Most notable here, ethnomusicologists working among pygmy groups across the Cong Congo Basin remark on similarities in their unusual, highly integrated, yo choral yodeled, so uh, alternating between chest and head voice, uh, and polyphonic, where multiple melodies will overlap in order to create a song, uh, singing style. Across the region, yodel and vocal polyphony together are consistently associated with gendered rituals that call forest spirits into camp, a cosmology and gender division of labor based on the opposition between men's bloodletting in hunting and women's bloodletting in reproduction, forest mobility, camps composed of these round leaf uh, huts, <coughs> excuse me, similar hunting collecting tools, uh, honey collecting tools, very intimate parent-child uh, relations, and an egalitarian political and economic social order. These elements are too specific to emerge from convergent evolution, and with genetic evidence proving a shared past, appear to be key components of a highly resilient and effective adaptation to forest hunting and gathering. These cultural continuities appear to have ancient roots given that genetic dating suggests the ancestors of these groups entered the forested region around 54,000 years ago, and the western Bayaka groups separated from the eastern and Mbuti groups some 27,000 years ago. Claiming a, deg a, a degree of cultural continuity over such great time spans is not to deny change, but rather emphasizes the remarkable resilience of the core structures organizing these egalitarian societies. From this point of view, assertively egalitarian societies are not primitive, which is a social evolutionary idea originating in justifications for late European colonialism, but highly successful adaptations for human living that have survived into the present because they've achieved a sweet spot based on fulfilling human needs without inequality. Such societies' persistence over time without directive institutions or status positions is testimony to the pleasure and efficacy of such forms of sociality for those living by them, based on personal autonomy, free access to key resources, on leveling off wealth inequalities, or actively resisting and rejecting claims to status, privilege, or authority, and by structuring key cultural <coughs> concepts with humor and shared pleasures at their core. Although anyone can address non-conformity non using mockery and avoidance, women have the main responsibility for this. By performing humorous reenactments, imitating offenders' behavior to the whole community, women are e experts at eliciting moral commentaries from onlookers that educate and remind all of social norms. Bayaka communication, like Bayaka society, is open, encompassing, and inclusive. It's a skillful multimodal deployment of a range of capacities inherent to human bodies that serve to establish relationships with as many creatures as possible. At the musical end, Bayaka vocal polyphony is predominantly composed of vowel sounds, rarely lyrics. At the other, in private speech, speakers routinely contract words by removing consonants and use sign language or imitate animals to disguise their communications from human and non-human others. Bayaka interchange vocal and visual signs and symbols ranging from full iconicity to total arbitrariness. 
These indices, icons, and symbols are copied or mimicked from fellow Baka, Bayaka, plants, animals, and other, lang and other people's languages, or from the forest soundscape itself. And they're recombined according to what they think will most effectively achieve their goals. So just so that you can get a sense of how people mix these different modes in their communication, I'll pr quickly show you Mongemba, my friend, uh, explaining something and see if you can work it out. talk about that later if you want. <laughs> Bayaka sign and whistle to communicate secretly in the presence of game. They mimic animal vocalizations to call prey to them. They mark plants and inform others coming behind. Mimic environmental sounds when recounting events. Freely borrow words from other, sorry, I meant to point to Mongimba, uh, from, from other people's languages. Sing to accompany daily activities or beat drums. Sing and dance in dense polyphonic rich singing rituals that engage the forest by mimic, mimicking its own sound back to it. To establish a dialogue between the camp and their environment. Telling sung fables, called gano, combines all these communicative forms to produce immersive reenactments of mythical times. And I'm going to play you a, a short example clip from one called Sumbu Awe, which means chimpanzee will die. Chimpanzee is insisting on wanting to get initiated into one of the male cults, uh, and it's going to be a disaster for him. And people are, the women are singing the songs, and chimpanzee is coming along and insisting on getting uh, initiated. And you can hear, you'll hear chimpanzee, you'll hear the women, you'll hear the storyteller occasionally throwing in a few words to guide the narrative. But uh, it, it really, these gano make the whole community become the myth, in fact. And it really is an immersive experience where you are your mythical ancestors. So their communicative strategies serve to maintain multi-species intercultural and multicultural relationships that reinforce the Bayaka view of themselves not as subjects in a society outside of nature, but rather as a society of nature. Just as a society of people implies communication and transaction between its members, Bayaka communication, uh, sorry, 
uh, between them. So a society of nature implies communication and transaction between its members. Biaka communication strategies are designed to achieve this. The forest is always, is always talking to them. Elephant is over there. Monkeys have seen pigs. Bees are going home. I, you should go home too. Frogs, if you hear them, are inviting you to drink. And so on. Other species engage similarly. For instance, dikers drawn to fruiting trees by colobus calls safely eat what the monkeys let fall from their mouths as they greedily stuff in the fruit, knowing that they will be warned of an approaching leopard by the monkeys' alarm calls. Bayaka participate in these interspecies exchanges, like other animist people, but in gendered ways. The ideology of sacredness and taboo focused on blood organizes the gendered division of labor. And it leads men and women to behave in different ways. Men walk in small groups or alone, treading carefully to avoid making noise and seek to sneak up on animals. To facilitate this, men mimic dikers, come and play call, meow, meow, meow. or they call crocodiles by mate, uh, using their, their mating calls, <coughs> and it works. Um, or pigs found good food, hoot, hoot, hoot. Uh, wild boar make these noises. Uh, monkeys, infants fell out of a tree. And all the big males start coming down within reach of your crossbow. <clears throat> when spear hunting large game, men use sign languages and bird calls to signal to one, other, one another while preparing the ambush. In contrast, women fear attack by dangerous animals when they walk in the forest because they smell of human fertility, exemplified by menstruation. As a result, women prefer to walk in large, boisterous groups with noisy children in tow while yodeling loudly like this. Women are explicit that they sing like this to keep dangerous animals such as leopard, elephant, buffalo and gorilla away. When predators such as leopards are trailing the camp or dangerous animals nearby, women will insist on singing through the night. The ever-present forest soundscape is composed of multiple overlapping animal, bird and insect calls. Every creature makes its distinctive contribution and some co uh, coordinate with each other such as cicadas do before the rain whereas others overlap or intertwine at their own pace and rhythm. When creatures contribute, they do so with their whole bodies, with all their vitality and their might. Bayaka say that the forest likes this, and if the forest is to keep their camp open to food, they, it, has to, it must hear good sounds coming from people too. Song, storytelling, laughter, happy conversations, and the calls of children playing. Just as the Bayaka listen to the forest to know about it, they say the forest is listening to them to know about them. When people want to charm the forest, they turn their part of the conversation into a lively song, a song which involves their whole bodies and mimics the forest back to itself. Using percussion, polyphonic singing and dancing, the Bayaka's ancestors have established particular ways of doing this they call spirit play. Each has its characteristic repertoire of melodies, songs and percussive polyrhythms that summon particular forest spirits. When the singing group achieves the synergistic harmony and synchrony familiar to good choirs or musicians, the forest shows its pleasure by allowing the mysterious forest spirits, sometimes embodied as leafy dancers, sometimes simply experienced as an ambiance, uh, an atmosphere, to enchant the participants and further deepen the joy and the profound bonding that they experience. Such singing is explicitly said to soften or charm those that hear it so that they give what is requested of them. So spirit plays such as Malobé, Bula or Yele demand specific game animals, animals such as elephants or pigs from the forest. Ejengi, the one you see in the corner, uh, says thank you for abundance uh, and so on. Shimha Arom, characterized by acapolyphonic singing in spirit play, as pure music, because the melody is not subjected to words. Indeed, Bayaka songs are not to be understood because of the words they use from human language,
but through the acoustic form they have adopted based on the forest's soundscape. In a poetic sense, their melodies are the forest's words. The intended recipient of these melodic utterances is the forest as an organic whole of which people, spirits, animals and plants are all part. By respecting cost costly signalling constraints in their vivacious ritual dancing and singing, they're able to commune and communicate with all the components of the forest, themselves included. In these egalitarian societies, without status positions such as judge or teacher, musical participation is the major social arena for learning key forest skills, cooperation and group coordination. Musical performances involve a wide range of poten potential meanings and functions, from the sound and structure of the music itself to the social and the political relationships established between performers in order to produce it. Or the way it signifies culture-specific concepts or identity and can organize time. Following Richard Widdis, in other work, I analyzed this style of singing as a foundational cultural schema. Through the performance of spirit plays, non-linguistic cultural models that cross-cut cultural realms such as economics, politics, history, and cosmology are re-experienced, practiced in a safe environment, and learnt by each generation. During spirit play performances, the whole camp assembles in gendered groups in the central space, sitting tightly, touching and resting limbs on each other. As their bodies intertwine, so too do their voices, singing different melodic lines. It's easy to lose oneself in this physical and acoustic mass and experience profound communitas. Singers seek to coordinate excellently just because it is beautiful. And the more beautiful it becomes, the more easily they enter their collective joy. They call it isengo. To achieve this, Bayaka explicitly worked to achieve a certain quality of relationships between participants. No arguing, no shouting or chatting, and all should share what they have by contributing as best they can. In conjunction with a musical education, there is a social and a political one. There's no hierarchy during musical performances. Although one may begin a song, anyone else can stop it and start a new one. Everyone is free to join whichever part of the polyphony they wish. To contribute appropriately, one must not drown out one's neighbours or sing the same melody as they do. Listening is as important as singing. If too many sing in unison, participants instinctively diverge by choosing alternative melodic lines to maintain the polyphony. <coughs> Regularly singing like this instills certain ways of coordinating and structuring groups uh, and group activities that are applied outside spirit play performances. For instance, the instinctive way that singers avoid unison has economic implications. In an egalitarian society, daily hunting and gathering activities are intuitively coordinated without anyone to order other people's activities. Being musically primed to do something different but complementary to others improves the chances that the camp will find food. Similarly, knowing a sufficient rage range of melodic modules and when to assert, insert them into the song structure resembles structurally the way that environmental knowledge is employed to identify and efficiently extract resources from the forest. Musical participation in spirit plays is the main avenue through which Bayaka learn these unspoken grammars of daily interaction. In such ways, learning to sing polyphonically and participating appropriately during performances inculcate particular cultural dispositions and patterns of behavior central to reproducing Bayaka, hunter, gatherer, culture, and society. Confirming this, when Bayaka seek to know the extent to which other groups are pygmies like themselves, they begin by discussing their ritual performances rather than their language. Judging their accomplishments at singing and dancing, at telling sung fables or public speaking, rather than on grammatical form or vocabulary. It's not what repertoire people are singing, but the polyphonic yodeling style that they use, not which steps they dance or which spirits they call, but the ritual structures they follow when doing so. Not the language they speak, but how it is spoken. The perception of what it means to be Bayaka is based on an aesthetic quality, in which structure or style matter more than content. Here, language in a formal sense is manifestly not synonymous with culture. Rather, 
It is the predatory encompassment of any meaningful and efficacious means for communicating that characterizes these hunter-gatherers. Many Bayaka groups have adopted grammatical structures and extensive vocabulary from uh, even a new language in the Baka case from non-Bayaka villager neighbors without losing their distinctive cultural identity. Aka and Baka, for instance, uh, two key groups in the Bayaka grouping, uh, see each other as sharing the same origins and culture despite Aka uh, speaking a Bantu language and Baka speaking an Ubangian one. They contrast their Bayaka lifestyles and values with those of their hierarchical villager neighbors, even when they speak the same language as those villagers. From their perspective, their distinctive socio-cultural aesthetic includes particular speech and singing and performance styles, a rejection of authority and inequality, a valuation of sharing and autonomy, expertise in big game hunting, a taste for forest foods above all other, and a love for the cool, shady forest over hot, open spaces of rivers and clearings. But just hearing their musical style is sufficient for them to identify other pygmies. When I played Mbuti music recorded in 1958 by Colin Turnbull uh, to Bayaka in Congo in 2010, about 1,500 kilometers away, they immediately recognized them as Bayaka, despite genetic studies demonstrating that they've been separated for over 25,000 years. This implies that this musical style is of considerable antiquity and therefore that the cultural dispositions it primes participants towards are probably refractions of a much more ancient egalitarian culture. As Whiten and Erdl argue, the role of egalitarianism is tightly bound to the evolutionary origins of the human socio-cognitive niche and deep social mind, whose principal components include forms of cooperation, egalitarianism, theory of mind, language and cultural transmission, and based on this hunter-gatherer perspective, I'd say on musical ritual too. Camilla Power has identified further shared features of ritual performance among the remaining egalitarian African hunter-gatherers. One of the most significant shared areas of ritual performance are highly gendered rituals of reverse dominance, in which women temporarily take over the camp. Across all these groups, it is women, not men, that take the lead and dominate the singing during community rituals. More specifically, beginning in the Kalahari, the widespread and likely very ancient Khoisan ritual, the Eland Bull Dance, takes place with a girl's first menstruation. Conceived of as an Eland Bull, she is secluded while other women dance around her, playfully mimicking the behavior of an Eland cow soliciting sex with her supernatural bull. The Tanzania Hadza girls' initiation ritual, Maitoko, involves similar sexual reversal and defiance, while bleeding initiates reenact a myth about an ancestral matriarch who dons a zebra's penis. Much like the Eland bull, this male animal enjoys intercourse with its numerous wives. Dreft, dressed as hunters, the Maitoko initiates, armed with long sticks, go into camp to chase young men. In the Congo Basin, both Eastern and Western pygmies have prominent rituals of reverse dominance that play an important role in maintaining gender egalitarianism. The Elima girls' initiation among the Eastern Mbuti involves girls becoming hunters and chasing young men with sticks in a very similar way to the Hadza. Among the Western Bayaka, women-led reverse dominance rituals are a regular part of life, known as Ngoku, during these lively ritual performances, all the women present join together, mixing beautiful song <coughs> and dance with raunchy, mocking imitations of male misbehavior in sexual interactions. Conceptualized as women's communal spirit, Ngoku acts out the mythic theme of a primordial time when women lived without men. The outcome of these bawdy displays of women's potential to accomplish reverse dominance is the achievement of gender egalitarianism persisting between ritual performances, supported by lower intensity, counter-dominant behaviors such as mockery and demand sharing. Contrary to academic, uh, popular academic stereotypes of egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands that conceive of male hunters often serving as the collective alpha, the ethnography of egalitarian <coughs> African hunter-gatherers suggests that the reverse is true that it is women that play the collective alpha role. The ethnography is more closely respected by Camilla Power's female cosmetic coalition model and Sarah Hurdy's work. 
since it is females who bear the significant burdens of rearing highly dependent, increasingly juvenile infants, it's not surprising that still today among these egalitarian groups, women's coalitions are central to ensuring egalitarianism persists so that males continue to provision their wives and offspring rather than rove around seeking other fertile females to impregnate as most other primate males do. By singing and dancing together as one, women speak as one. If one spoke for them as a leader, men might attack her. Or if all spoke at once, it would be difficult to understand. But when all sing, the message is reinforced and repetition strengthens the point rather than tiring listeners. The centrality of these reverse dominance rituals among all the remaining groups of African hunter-gatherers suggests that they're of considerable antiquity and have their likely origins in the coalitionary so solidarity created when women sing together all night long. This provides a more ethnographically plausible account of the origins of we intentionality than primitive warfare models. Egalitarian hunter-gatherers avoid or flee contact conflict rather than engage. They're not aggressively territorial, and without leaders with authority, they have great difficulty in organizing resistance to outside aggression. The notion that warfare or territorial conflict drove the evolution of we intentionality is simply ethnocentric. In our recent article, Wild Voices, Chris Knight and I argue that coalitionary displays of resistance aimed at large predators are sufficient to build the sense of us as opposed to them. A display of resistance against some external threat, while sounding aggressive to outsiders, may be heard as comforting and supportive by members of the signaler's own group. Singing, as Camilla Power argues, is what Dunbar's vocal grooming had to be if it was to produce the opiate stimulation associated with the pleasure of physical grooming. The production of oxytocin in those singing together establishes trust between participants within the coalition. Once the coalition is realized, boundaries can shift. The singing women can redraw it between themselves and the men, or between themselves and a troublemaker. And Bayaka women still do this today. So you get a sense of uh, what a display of reverse dominance looks like. I just want you to watch a, a brief few snippets from something that normally lasts for several days.
So, Bayaka communicative practices illustrate the importance of playful mimesis in driving their creative spoken and sung engagement with humans and non-humans. What begins as an index of an animal's state, like the found good food hoot of a pig, once imitated by a person in order to kill the pig, becomes an iconic for nations, though still heard by the in animal as an index. But when returning with his pig on his back and dropping the carcass in the camp, uh, the, the hunter... Uh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the hunter makes the same sound, whoo, redirecting it into the human coalition, the sound has become a symbol. These icons, indices and symbols are copied or mimicked from fellow Bayaka, plants, animals and other people's languages or the forest landscape and are recombined according to what will most effectively achieve particular goals. Sometimes they're intended to provide selective or secretive communication as when men use sign language or whistle to one another preparing an ambush. Other times they intend all to hear and rejoice as when the whole community uh, sings together. Just as each sex employs different reproductive and productive strategies, so too do they differ in their use of similar propensities for mimicry aimed at outsiders. Men's mimicry focuses on enabling them to approach animals more easily, whereas women's mimicry keeps animals away. When women redeploy their mimicry within the group, they use it to shame individuals who don't respect the moral order, potentially keeping them away too. Women's mimicry depends on their solidarity for its effectiveness. Their collective action bonds singing participants, establishes trust between them, and a normative order governing their relations. Such mocking mimicry offers an ethnographically plausible account of what has been called the platform of trust and a normative order, both central uh, to the, uh, the evolution of language because they allow redirected icons to be transformed into symbols without resistance from conspecifics. By analogy, the gendered use of mimicry by early hominins could first have developed as a means to deceive animals and only later became a means to communicate between people. The problem of dealing with predators once mostly living on the ground was successfully overcome by Homo erectus, suggesting that voluntary vocalizations were a key component of early Homo survival strategies. The successive development of the auditory tract among Erectus, leading to the modern vocal tract among Heidelbergensis, may have been driven by the survival advantages vocalizations provided in first warding off predators, and then later in becoming more effective predators ourselves. <coughs> this ethnographically derived scenario predicts that iconicity should still be significant in languages today. Brent Berlin hints at how this can happen by demonstrating the role of onomatopoeia and phonesthesia in determining suitable names for things. He suggests that non-arbitrary sound symbolic photomimetic reference must have had enormous adaptive significance for our hominin ancestors. That the intuitively plausible and metaphorically motivated principles of phonesthesia serve to drive lexicon in general. Ramachandran and Hubbard show that phonesthesia generates lexicon when heard sounds are processed into movements of the tongue on the palate. Multimodal mimicry seems to pervade human communicative practices. More recently, Blasi and colleagues show that thousands of modern languages continue to demonstrate certain sound meaning association biases that may be artifacts of these older processes. The recent work of Edmonston and his colleagues and Perlman and Lupien show that such processes remain salient even in modern hyperformalized languages. In their experiments, people were able to imitate sounds to invent iconic vocalizations that represented actions, objects, and animals that unfamiliar individuals accurately recognized and interpreted. Perlman and Lupien argue that this demonstrates how iconic vocalizations can enable interlocutors to establish understanding in the absence of conventions. They suggest that prior to the advent of full-blown spoken languages, people would have used iconic vocalizations to ground a spoken vocabulary with, significant, uh, sorry, with considerable semantic depth. The hunter-gatherer ethnography, in conjunction with this growing work on the role of iconicity in generating lexicon, suggests that early language-like behaviors were likely to be both vocal and gestural. 
So the work I'm presenting here is, part, is put into the context of language evolution in this paper. Of relevance here, we want to point out that the great ape patrilocal pattern of dispersal at sexual maturity, what's called male phylopatry, had to be reversed for evolving homo mothers to get the parenting support they needed for human brains to exceed the grey ceiling uh, of six to seven hundred centiliters. By moving away from her natal group on reaching maturity, grape ape females are without female relatives who can be trusted to look after their offspring. Without such support, hominin mothers one and a half million years ago, like great apes today, would risk excessively high levels of, in, of stress and infant mortality, making further encephalization very unlikely. Cooperative breeding allowed Erectus to increase population sizes even when greatly exceeding this gray ceiling, producing brains twice as large as those of chimpanzees. When an evolving hominin mother lets others hold her baby, <coughs> then selection pressures for two-wayed mind reading and triadic structures of joint attention are set up. In the initial stages, as suggested by Hawke's and colleagues' grandmother hypothesis, a mother's close kin were key to this development, driving the evolution of extended female reproductive lifespans. But for a mother to assist with her daughter's children, she must live close by. This is incompatible with popular, popular patrilocal assumptions for hunter-gathering bands. Patrilocality is rare among egalitarian African hunter-gatherers. Rather, Khoisan <coughs> and Central African pygmies exhibit a deep-time bias to matrilocality, today exhibited by the ubiquitous practice of bride service, where male sexual access depends on success in provisioning his wife's family. Based on this, it's clear that these early female-dominated groups caring for numerous dependent infants bore the greatest risk of predation. As suggested by Bayako's own, uh, Bayako women's own reasons for singing, when our ancestors were vulnerable hominins living in the open with limited weaponry, increasing the range and diversity of their vocal cords, a uh, calls would have been one way to keep nocturnal predators at bay. Fitch and Zuberhola show that the distinctively human ability to produce pitch variations evolved after we split from our closest primate relatives. Large felines prowling in the dark may have been wary of approaching a noisy group of hominin females and infants if unexpected pitch variations made it difficult to estimate group size and the consequent risk of injury. Interestingly, coalitions of lionesses use synchronized roaring to warn rivals of their numerical strength and so ward off other prides they sense approaching their territory. Some human groups cohabitating with feline predators continue to apply this principle. Just as Bayaka women love to regularly sing night long during the spirit play Nyeti that requires all fires to be extinguished in the pitch darkness of no moon, so had the women also extinguish all fires and sing vocal poly polyphonies through moonless nights each month during their most significant ritual, the Ipimir dance. An Indian forest people, the Nilig Nilgiri Irulas, explain that one reason they make music is because the rhythmic clapping, drumming, chanting and choral singing keep dangerous animals such as tigers away. Nightlong Khoisan trance dancing depends on a female dominated polyphonic chorus to support the mostly male dancers enter trance states. Elizabeth Marshall Thomas suggests that this ritual, whose sound can travel for miles around, once also served to keep animals away. Among these African hunter-gatherers, women, women take the lead in singing, with men playing a secondary role. The ethnography fits the women and children versus predator hypothesis to account for the evolution of music better than the sexual selection by male vocalizers that's been proposed by Bjorn Merker and similarly by Miller. One of the mythological universals unearthed by Levi Strauss in his Mythologique appears to be an ancient refraction of this, an association between darkness, the absence of cooking fire, and the production of loud noises. Evolving hominins' experience of being predator at one moment and prey the next was such an emotionally charged recurring event that its echoes continue to shape much human ritual action and cosmology today, as has been demonstrated in different parts of the world by Maurice Bloch, uh, Philippe Descola, and Viveros de Castros. 
This suggests that small groups singing for their lives on dark moonless nights is an evolutionary stable strategy for dealing with predation pressure when group living. Perhaps such practices are part of what enabled Erectus to spread into new habitats and further enhance control of breathing and phonation. The articulatory capacities of their vocal system and their ability to listen. These developments are suggested by the presence of an ear canal of modern proportions, implying, in the words of Cross and Morley, that vocal sounds were increasingly significant for this species. However, it's by 700 to 500,000 years ago, with the appearance of the ancestor often identified as Homo heidelbergensis, that the full model, a modern vocal tract and an auditory system sensitive to speech frequencies was fully evolved. Ian Crossney and Morley conclude that this co-adaptation suggests that vocal sounds were crucially significant for this species, more so than other environmental sounds. Based on this development, it is possible that Heidelbergensis had begun to mimic out of context, to use animal calls as hunting lures, and to facilitate coordinating big uh, game hunting, and that defiantly singing females had developed emergent we intentionality, joint commitment, and emerging strategies of sexual and political counter-dominance. This is supported by Marin and Perry's work on cognitive evolution, proposing that the close correspondence between the networks of regions involved in singing and speaking suggests that speech may have evolved from an already complex system for the voluntary control of vocalization. Their divergences suggest that the later evolving aspects of these two uniquely human abilities are essentially hemispheric specializations. Furthermore, as Kirsch and Siebel conclude, it appears that the human brain, at least at an early age, does not treat language and music as strictly separate domains, but rather treats language as a special case of music. Group chorusing to deter predators provides a model in which costly signaling constraints are respected and vocal control is selected for. As increasingly complex forms of vocalizations, often inspired phonosynesthetically or mimetically, improved the deceptiveness of vocalizations, they provided increased gendered survival benefits to the individuals composed, composing the chorus in group. If music still so powerfully wrenches our emotions and can keep us dancing all night, it may be because we retain a naive costly signal of faith in the honesty of those pitch alterations representing genuine changes in arousal states. To alternate between fast and slow rhythms when singing or dancing, the singer or dancer has to put in effort to work themselves up, experiencing real changes in bodily and emotional state. Over generations, regularly chorusing at night would have encouraged greater vocal dexterity and improved ability to entrain to pulse or rhythm <coughs> and potentially the beginnings of vocal learning as participants imitated novel techniques or pleasing styles. As Ian Cross and Ian Morley point out, by providing a forum for the practice of integrated, complex, coordinated group activities, resulting in a powerful sense of membership and trust that provides a coherent explanation as to why these musical behaviours persisted at a group level. In the context of musical participation, rhythm serves to synchronise actions across large groups of people. Indeed, this could be a modern way of reformulating soci sociologist Emile Durkheim's original hypothesis that people in training together while singing in community-wide ritual is what established the first collectively shared conceptual repertoires upon which the normative conditions for human culture and language evolved. While there's no way of knowing to what extent early hominin chorusing resembled contemporary musics, it is likely to have involved rhythmic entrainment and therefore sounded musical to modern ears. A few other species entrained to periodic pulse, certain parrots, fireflies, crickets, or frogs, for instance, and these examples have been used to suggest that rhythmic entrainment can emerge easily in biological systems. But as Kim Sir Fitch remarks, this is the paradox of rhythm. Periodicity and entrainment seem to be among the ba most basic features of living things, yet the human ability and proclivity to entrain our motor output to auditory stimuli seems to be very rare. While rhythm is widespread in biological systems, humans' ability to entrain their actions to rhythms far exceeds that observed in other animals and is evidence of an advanced multimodal ability to synchronize action or voice 
with the perception of rhythm, something that Anirudh Patel argues is key to the neurobiology of complex vocal learning on which language depends. A million years of singing for one's life may offer an explanation for this human proclivity. Although we may never know what early hominin chorusing sounded like, there are some remarkable similarities in the overlapping polyphonic vocal style of the four hunter-gatherers groups I've discussed here. Somewhat extending the Bayaka view, Victor Grauer, in his ambitious review of the diffusion of musical styles across the world, uses these similarities and genetic connections to suggest that what we now hear is a refraction of the musical style practiced by the ancient proto-Khoisan pygmy population from which these groups originally descended. Maybe vocal polyphony is the closest we can get to hearing the echoes of our forgotten ancestors. <coughs> to leave Jerome to field the question. I'm going to go downstairs briefly. You're all invited at 5.30 to the ritual with beer and cheese down in the concourse. Um, so um, it's a beautiful. OK, well, thank you. I don't, does anyone have any questions that uh, they'd like to ask? I'd certainly welcome them. This isn't yet published, this work, so uh, I, I really do welcome critical uh, reflections on it because uh, I'm in the process of writing it up for publication. Yes? So part of the argument is that uh, they're singing in order to uh, like uh, scare away predators or whatever in the, in the forest as they're walking, but like, what's the difference between that and just advertising that they're there? Like, don't they have to be already formidable so that the predators understand like, uh, I really shouldn't fuck with these well, what's what's interesting? Sorry. You're vulnerable and you're advertising your presence. That's what, that's what I'm saying. It's like if you're, if you're yeah. yeah. Well, fire is has a uh, has a similar uh, reason. But no, the, the 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 reason is that predators are actually extremely risk averse. If you're a lion and you just have a small bit of damage to your front paw or you break a tooth, it really does affect your your opportunities for successful hunting. Uh, and it's that risk aversion which is what I think this business of singing plays on. So uh, in, wh when, when you're singing in this way, it's very difficult to guess how many people are present because you've got all these alternating voices changing between uh, the chest and the, and the head voice. And so although it may just be five or six people, it sounds like it's 20. And, and once the, the so a marauding lion, for instance, hears that, it becomes very, ooh, should I go for it or shouldn't I go for it? Am I going to get hurt or aren't I going to get, oh, well, I'll go for something easier. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, the natural reaction of people when they, uh, you may have heard this advice perhaps, but uh, if you encounter a grizzly bear, you're, you're supposed to go, oh, 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 and make yourself big and noisy and, and problematic. Again, that plays on this risk aversity of predators. Uh, and that's what I think the singing does and why it works so effi efficiently. Okay, we've got three questions. We'll have one at the back and then we'll come forward. Yes? Please. Yes? It all strikes me as the <coughs> emotional communication, the singing in, in this, and, uh, and the, the, uh, well, the animal sounds, the lions roaring and so forth. I mean, you talk about rhythm, I mean, that's certainly one aspect of the book, um, but the Thank you. 
frequencies of the um, sounds that are being produced that are communicating intention of the of a, it's, it's a communication of, of emotional states between the animals and the Yeah, well, that's certainly how the Bayaka read it. I mean, you know, when they hear the little bird chirruping away happily on the thing, they say, you know, the forest likes that. That makes the forest happy. And that's what they model their own sung engagement with the forest. It's because the forest wants to hear those you know, happy sounds effectively. I mean, one, there are different ways of presenting all those different rituals. And one way, which is actually closer to the way the Bayaka understand it, is that each is a particular... Uh, technology of joy, uh, that each of those different rituals summons to the human group a particular quality of joy. Uh, joy is a very poor uh, you know, uh, word to describe a wide range of emotions that, that we all go through. Uh, and so there are certain joys which are, are very masculine, uh, where as men we all bind together and, and as we sing we, we stamp on the ground as we move up and down the camp uh, and it's, it's, it's scary, but it's also comforting because those men who are making this big, bassy sound are also the men who are protecting you from these dangerous animals. So, they're, they, they're, and, I mean, I could go on, but they have a whole range of these different qualities of joy, and, and each of those spirit plays is about bringing that quality reliably into the community. And they're the most cherished things, the most valued things in their society, uh, those spirit plays. Thank you. So we had a question in the middle there? Sorry. No. Yes, it was you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for a super interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the way you sit, set up your position as kind of a foil to the view that warfare was one of the main uh, generators or one of the main motivations for the intentionality. So yeah. I'm guessing you had in mind people like Thomas Ello, Franz de Waal. Exactly. Franz de Waal says empathy came about because of our prohibition for warfare. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the fundamental problem with that model of uh, the emergence of we intentionality, while well, I understand the, the point you're making, uh, is that there's no ethnographic evidence to support that hunter-gatherers behave like that. Uh, you know, the, all, I mean, there are in certain parts of the uh, extreme north where you have very key resources that people depend upon, like salmon rivers, where hunter-gatherers will unite to fight, but those aren't egalitarian hunter-gatherers, those are very hierarchical hunter-gatherers. And that's why throughout my talk I've been very specific about referring to egalitarian hunter-gatherers and not these hierarchically organized ones. And indeed among the hierarchically one, uh, organized ones, and maybe as you quite rightly say, it's from doing ritual activities together, you bond the group of warriors and, and war songs and so on are all part of that psychology, if you like, of, of going to war. Um, but, but the evidence from the egalitarian groups is quite the opposite, is that you know, if, if we take uh, Erdl and Whiten and others seriously and that we, we understand egalitarianism, which is something I think is true, uh, is key to establishing group-wide trust in the first place, so all the males stop competing with one another because each male has got his own female and, and suddenly you can cooperate in ways that weren't possible in primate societies, for instance. Um, so uh, the... Uh, the focus on uh, we intentionality through predators, you've got a, an obvious enemy there that isn't another group of people. And so it's not about warfare, it's just about us you know, existing here in this space. Uh, and, and that's why I think that I, I still wouldn't be able to accept <laughs> that it is uh, related to warfare in any clear way. Uh, that just doesn't seem to happen. These groups welcome outsiders. They, 
They're, they're encompassing, even people who are really mean, lazy, and good for nothing are always incorporated, and uh, you know, it, th there's no e chance to refuse anybody. I've often been amazed, people have been behaving terribly. Uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, free riding is a, a, a non-issue for these hunter-gatherers. There are loads of free riders, and nobody bats an eyelid. It's just part, you know, and, and actually, if you spend time, you realize that you know, while someone might be lazy at a particular point in their lives, yeah, things happen, they change, and then they actually stop being lazy, and it's just a phase they were going through. And uh, these people are much more tolerant of that kind of thing than we are. So we've got a question here, and then we had one in the front, and we'll come back to you. Um, your, your focus on Africa makes me wonder if you've got any, kind of any idea about how this general idea of the function of music and so forth plays out in the Amazon, in Australia, in New Guinea, uh, I mean, I'm not expecting you to be yeah. an expert on all of these places where there are hunter gatherers, but it would seem an obvious, an obvious question that if, if in moving away, mm. they have lost this stuff, that maybe it's not quite so, quite so central after all. I, 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 well, I mean, that's a very I good question, and, and I'm not adequately, I'm not qualified to answer it. I you know, must be very clear. That's a huge areas that you're, you're touching upon there. But I think that there are uh, perhaps ecological features which would lead to these sorts of behaviours persisting once people moved out of Africa, obviously over huge timescales that we're, we're discussing here. Um, so, I mean, I do think that probably for Pleistocene hunter-gatherers, it was really important. It still mattered greatly um, because you still had lots of large predators around. But, uh, but of course, you know, in, over the past, uh, whatever, 10,000 years or so, the numbers of large predators and very large animals has diminished significantly. And, uh, and so uh, when you enter into areas where you don't have those kinds of environmental stimuli, maybe these sorts of things get diluted and changed. Uh, and there are quite big differences in the s political social organization of uh, hunter-gatherers in, in, say, Amazonia, where they're mostly actually horticulturalists who've been suffered warfare or, or other forms of depredation that have led to them losing their land. Uh, similarly, in New Guinea, uh, it, it does seem that the, the, there's one particular case which could be real genuine hunter-gatherers, but yeah. the rest do seem to be ha farmer horticulturalists who've lost their land for various reasons. So I think that the, the situation is much more complex once we move out of Africa, mm -hmm. and the variations, I think, will have different reasons and different explanations. Yes? Well, uh, the, the only, I mean, I'm not a geneticist. I rely on the geneticists to, to feed me these numbers. But uh, they, it's only very recently that they've done these studies of the uh, interrelationships between these different groups of hunter-gatherers in Africa. And indeed, currently, there's a lot more work being done on the, uh, the genetic relationships between African people. And, and I think that will be very revealing. But so far, what the information seems to suggest is that these groups of people uh, the Western groups and these Eastern groups are last shared a mother 27,000 years ago. Um, and of course, that's, you know, uh, uh, it's not a precise figure. I'm sure it's plus or minus a few thousand years. But it's still striking when you think of a musical style or, and indeed the cultural tradition that is associated with that musical style uh, over those great periods. Um, Victor Grauer, who's the ethnomusicologist who looks at the diffusion of music around the world based on genetic relationships, he talks about 100,000 years ago being the key point where this musical tradition uh, was, 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 was really very central to probably most human beings alive. Uh, the Khoisan still have polyphonic singing rituals. Uh, there's a slightly differently organ or structured polyphonic music, but uh, it's remarkably similar when you listen to it. Um, and then all these pygmy groups have, have you know, essentially the same style of music. So based on the genetics, that's the only way that we can date these things. Um, and uh, how precise that is is not something I can comment on very accurately. Thank you. Yes? Um, I know you've been working on this for a very, very long time. Um, but I was curious, because, because ethnography uh, is a methodology that is um, people call a thick description. It's a hypothesis generating. It's something that is a continual uh, re-evaluation process. How do you hope others in your field or people in other fields will take, for example, this 
Well, uh, it depends very much who you're talking about. But, uh, I mean, for instance, with my own PhD students, I've just encouraged quite a number of ethnomusicologists to get out to other hunter-gatherer groups around the world, egalitarian hunter-gatherer groups, um, to find out if we can find more consistency uh, in these practices uh, across different groups. And uh, in Southeast Asia, I had a very good uh, uh, ethnomusicologist working there. And because of the pressure of the missionaries uh, on these groups uh, and the, uh, the secrecy, or the, they have very complex taboo structures around musical performances where they summon spirits. So they have actually almost completely uh, hidden to the point of disappearance their musical tradition and they hardly ever perform. Uh, so it's, we're at a stage, unfortunately, where because of these, the, the, the power of outside pressures, the ability of roads to crisscross what were previously rather protected environments, uh, the picture is very unclear. And, uh, and I do hope that more and more people will start looking at music uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding how musical participation produces particular ways of being in the world and why music is so central to culture. But, I mean, you can look at it across all sorts of different domains. So, for instance, uh, you know, fashion in Britain, uh, youth fashion in particular, it's not just a, a particular style of music that they're listening to. It's also a, a way of dressing. It's a way of talking. It's a, a whole value system. And I think that the link between music and culture uh, is, is extremely interesting and one which, which I hope we'll, we'll start to, to unpick and, and explain in much more detail as time goes by. Thanks. You had a question. Was it you? No? All right. Sorry. Ah, yeah. All right. We'll get to you. Yeah? Okay. Uh, does anyone have any ideas what he was talking about? Hunting, yes. Killing an animal, yes, yes. Any ideas what animal? No. Not a gorilla. It was an elephant. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, but it's, it's, what it is is an illustration of the way that people mix this environmental mimicry in their storytelling. And it's, it's so pronounced that it points... People, if they start telling a story of them going into, a, 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 say, a farmer's village where they speak a different language, they'll say, oh, I met so-and-so, a farmer. And when they're reporting his speech, instead of translating it, they just report in the language of the farmer. And, uh, and, and, and even when they get to the point of the limit of their own knowledge of that language, instead of you know, going back into Bambenje, they just continue making, aping the sounds of that language. It's almost like the acoustic integrity of the moment is more significant than what we would anticipate in terms of meaning. Uh, and uh, and it's, 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 a very, it's very frustrating when you're trying to learn the language because they're teaching you loads of words for everything. And you start wondering, do women have different language to men? Do children speak differently to adults? And Anyway, slowly I understood that uh, they're teaching me all the languages of all their neighbours too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, you had a question. Group. Uh, from another group as yeah. you know, another culture. Now, a little bit of conjecture that we, there's a need to distinguish you, yourself, your in-group from the out-group is a driving force of language and culture yeah. change. Right? You speak your own, you know, as you mentioned, the youth culture with like their own codes and things. Do you have any sense of whether language and culture is more stable in egalitarian societies than in hierarchical societies where there might be kind of a little bit of prestige and Well, it's a very good question. Um, what, what I think is that um, when you're a hunter-gatherer in a world of hierarchically organized people who are status-seeking and so on, uh, your way of life, your political orientation is so radically different to those other groups that there's no need to worry about language as an indicator. I mean, you, you actually, I think it's to do with similarity uh, that we get hooked on language. So French and British people, you know, basically the same people. Uh, and so language then becomes, and, and cuisine and, and, and stuff, you know, these become the focus of our differences or establishing our difference. Uh, but when you're a hunter-gatherer, your way of life is just so different and your value system is so opposed. I mean, 
These groups really reject private property. They find it absolutely abhorrent. It's morally repulsive to them. Uh, and, and so the, the word they use to describe all their neighbours uh, is gorilla, because gorillas are also obsessed with private property and get really furious when you walk across a bit of forest that they've claimed. Uh, and so where your value system is so different, then you don't need to worry about language. The, the group that sing like that 1,500 uh, kilometres away, they actually speak a Sudanic language, whereas this group speak a Bantu language. So I think actually it's music which is more stable than language. Language is much more open to change, and perhaps that's to do with uh, language always being subject to recomposition. Every time I say a sentence, I'm recomposing the language. But if I was to sing a song, uh, you know, if I, I would always sing it in roughly the same way. Uh, and so there's actually a greater duration of uh, form in song uh, or music than there is in, in language, which is much more subject to, to change and transformation. I think the other thing as well to say is that when you're in a hierarchical structure, uh, there are individuals who get given responsibility over different elements of your culture, say the, the priest or the shaman or whatever, and they can decide to change things. And there's nobody there to you know, say, oh, you can't change that, because they're the ones in charge. Uh, and so in these egalitarian structures where you don't have anybody in charge, where you, you learn your ways of being in that society through participation in, say, the song and dance that uh, I've been showing you examples of, uh, then it's much more difficult for those things to change. And part of the resilience of these societies is precisely because uh, there's no individual that can manipulate these processes, they're collective processes, through taboo or, or through ritual per performances. Uh, and, and, and that gives them much greater stability than we have in hierarchical societies where specific individuals can turn everything on its head uh, at a whim if they wish. Yes? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> So this is a question about sign language. Sorry, I'm just speaking up. No. So the So the question is whether or not in the sort of the, the first film I showed you of the man exp uh, giving you a description of his elephant hunts, uh, whether there are grammatical structures within the signing that he uses. And I, that's a wonderful question, uh, and I can't answer it, I'm afraid, but I would be delighted if you'd be interested, um, and, and I can supply you with some other examples of this kind of uh, interaction and then you can see whether or not uh, it's, it's obvious uh, that there are grammatical phrases. Uh, it, I, I don't think there are, but, uh, but I'm really not qualified to be able to judge. But thank you, that's a very interesting angle. So, Mr. Patience at the back, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, can you just repeat that? So you said there's egalitarian. Yeah. Women mimic those who are trying to show off as if you put them down. Yeah. But isn't there a singer that sings best in cooperation? A singer that sings best? In cooperation. So he's, he, like, they're good at singing within a group. And they can cooperate with everyone else. So you say that, like, you can have a singer who tries to show off. But the singer who tries to be, like, within the group, doesn't that give them status? And if you have, like, a group that works, Well, um, I mean, all those things might be possible. I've never uh, witnessed them. Uh, of course, there are some people who are better at doing things than others, but in these sorts of contexts, it's rude 
uh, and considered impolite to refer to that. So, uh, a friend, let me take the example of hunting, which is a classic one, especially in these sort of socio-biological uh, examinations of hunter-gatherers. Uh, one of my friends is an exceptional hunter. Uh, he is so exceptional. I've never met anybody like him. Uh, he's so exceptional that uh, at one point he shot an elephant which had tusks that were digging in the ground as the elephant walked along. They were so huge. It took three men to carry one tusk. I mean, they must have been close to 90 kilos or something like that. When he, when he brought these tusks out of the forest, the person who'd given him this gun to go shooting the elephant, a uh, farmer, was so uh, amazed, he, he took him down to Brazzaville, the, the capital city, uh, which is a two-week journey, uh, and, and displayed this, this hunter with his tusks. The result was that this man uh, just started to boast. And he, he doesn't do it in a conscious way. It's, it, that's the real tragedy, actually, of his life, is that he, he just can't help himself, but he loves hunting, and he loves going hunting, and he's always going hunting, or at least he was in the past. But then, from their perspective... Uh, like your example of the good singer. You know, oh, you're hunting so much. Why are you hunting so much? Oh, I just love hunting. Well, stop hunting for a bit, because we want to do some hunting too. And, and anyone who starts to stand out is immediately pulled down again and, uh, and told to stop hunting. And he was told to stop hunting, but because he loved hunting so much, he continued hunting. Uh, and, and, and people started to get suspicious. Why are you hunting so much? You think you're better than us? Do you? Why do we always have to eat your meat? What about other people's meat? We can eat their meat too. And he got a lot of criticism. In the end, he actually got cursed to meet gorillas when he goes hunting. And I've never come across anybody who meets as many gorillas as he does. And gorillas aren't good to meet. You know, they are frighteningly dangerous. You, know, you get a silverback roaring, beating its chest, come tearing across at you. And, and so he'd waste a bullet shooting these silverbacks uh, uh, to, to, to protect himself. And because he thought that the, the silverbacks were actually his jealous, uh, jealous friends who were upset by him hunting too much, he would leave them in the forest. He wouldn't dare to cut them up and bring them back. And hunt, the hunter-gatherers don't actually eat gorilla. Uh, they say it's too much like a person. But the farmers like eating gorilla. So the farmers would get really cross that he, wasn't, he was wasting these bullets and not bringing the meat back. But as far as he was concerned, this was terrible. In the end, it was the women who said, right, look, enough. We're not cooking your meat anymore. And, uh, and he'd just shot an elephant, and he'd just spent seven or eight hours butchering this, the meat of the elephant. And the women said, no, we're not cooking anymore. And he was outraged. All this work, all the risk I've just taken. And it actually caused him to have to leave. The women effectively exiled him. And he was then rejected completely by everybody. He went, he, the only place he could go was a neighboring group of pygmies called the Baluma, where they were very poor, uh, not well-experienced hunters in, in the way that he was, and he became very popular. In 2012, this was in 1996, I met him again in 2012 in, a, in another pygmy group called the Mikaya, who I was visiting for a different purpose. And, and I just saw him at the back, and he saw me, and we recognized each other. So he'd actually been rejected by not just one group of pygmies, but by two. And each time, devastating for him personally, because it was his whole family and all his connections. You want to come back on that? Yeah. Oh, they'll tease you and give you hell. You, there's no subtlety in boasting. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. If you come back after you've hunted, what you do is you just sit down quietly without saying a word. <laughs> this could clearly go on for a long time. Well, let's go. Uh, so I'm going to draw the formal dis discussion to a halt. We're going to go downstairs. The beer Thank you very much. The bread. Help yourself. <laughs>